Okay, um, just to introduce myself, um, I'm Darren Geary, I'm an IT project manager and I'm here with Lisa Teasdale, HR operations and systems manager. We've travelled all the way from the University of York today um, to talk to you about a, a recent project that we've managed um, uh, on casual compliance. Um, talk about the, how we manage the change um, and some of the lessons that we learned that we want to share with you today in terms of um, the benefits of the project. Um, in terms of the, the project itself was um, casual worker compliance. Um, the profile of uh, casual workers at the university, we've got 3,000 active workers. We're applying uh, a new system, um, in fact building a new system with a supplier, an external supplier. Uh, we were developing and applying new uh, processes, new policies, and new people, creating a new centralized team to manage casual worker compliance at the university, or to manage, manage casual workers as a whole. Um, we deal with over 200 new starters each month, and we have over 1,600 payroll claims each month as well. And 80% of our casual workers are students, so I'm sure this is a similar profile uh, to other universities as well. So it is impacting the, the, the students' experience. We've come to talk to you today about it because it's been a, the project's been a great success. Um, when, we first, when I first started the university, which was January last year, they gave me this project and I thought I'd run over a nest of robins because I thought this is going to be really challenging, uh, some of the changes that we're going to um, be applying, but also there was a reluctance to change in our department and subsidiaries. And the, the, the thinking there was, if it isn't broken, why do we want to fix it? Um, so that's a big challenge that we have to face. Um, but when we've come to the end of this, we applied all this new capability in the summer this year, and the departments and the people that it impacted have come back to us and said how positive the change was, how they felt they were involved, um, and we, they want us to apply similar methodologies to future projects as well. So I, I think that's sort of huge credit to the project and how we work with this. Just moving on, one of the things that we, um, I think has been very central to the project itself was our vision, um, written by our sponsor, linking to the university strategy, but it, we saw it throughout the project as the, the foundation for the change. So we applied and we referred to it throughout the project in all our communications, and, and it helped us um, to establish who we needed to engage with, how we needed to engage with them, and, and what we were aiming to achieve as well. So when people were challenging us about what we were doing, we were referring back to the vision, and these are the reasons why uh, we need to do this, and these are some of the, the changes that we've got to apply here. But it also refers to the value um, that, that's going to be applied to these people, um, to the users, and, and if they see value in it, then we get the buy-in from them for the project. As well, in, in the communication, so linking back to the vision, why are we doing this project? And it, one big theme that came through with this was educating our users. Why are we doing this project? Why do we need to make this change? And these are the themes that, that came through. The main reason was compliance. Um, right to work checks, um, national minimum wage, were, were risks, tier four student immigration, and GDPR, we got data sets all across the university in various departments, and there were some huge issues there. I don't know if you want to add anything to this, Lisa. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't have a mic, so I'm just going to shout. If you can't hear me in that way, I'm going to have to try and shout a bit louder. Um, as legislation moves on, and I don't know about all of you guys, but we find legislation moves quite quickly, and things sort of sneak in. Um, you know, you must display on your pay slip They have big, it's a very small bit of legislation, but they have big implications for the university and trying to make sure that we were keeping pace with them and that we could get our departments to keep pace with them was quite a challenge. But, um, our university is quite widely dispersed, our departments um, self-manage to a point, they think that they can do their own thing, which isn't always a fight to us. <coughs> to try and get the messages to them and to get them to understand
understand why we need to change things and what we were doing was really, really quite difficult, which is why we wanted the project to help us to reach those people. So then we've got lots of tools at our um, command, as I'm sure you all do. We've got newsletters and web pages and communication meetings and um, admin groups and faculty groups and all of these things, and you go along to all of them. Somehow you still manage to miss people who, who months later go, I don't know anything about that, nobody told me. So we wanted the project to try and bring all those people together to get them to understand why these things matter and what the risks are. It didn't mean we weren't necessarily compliant, but we wanted people to understand how things were moving and also to create a platform to keep that going. It's not a one-off thing, it's a journey that we're on. And we know we need to keep this momentum that we've managed to get going for the future and to try and get our departments to engage with us as a central function, which isn't always the easiest thing, we're a central function, um, and keep that dialogue and create a partnership approach. And so that was one of the aims of our project as well. And uh, as Lisa said, the education side, so getting across the impact of uh, if some of these risks did uh, come to be realised, uh, an example would be um, the, the tier four and right to work, you know, the fine for um, a breach there, £20,000, well, in the scheme of things, you know, people saying, well, that's not a lot, but then when you think of the damage to our reputation, the risk that that could have as well to our um, um, organisation if we lost trusted sponsor status, um, is um, what was a real concern. So the impact could be catastrophic, catastrophic to the university. Sorry. Also, when we're going out to, to our colleagues in the departments uh, and faculties, um, the benefits and values. So we had the main drivers were compliance. We were very clear about that, what we needed to do, but also communicating to them the secondary reasons and the value added for the users um, so that they could see what's in it for me. And, and I think that's one thing um, that we, we wanted to highlight very early. And once we'd done the communication and the education about the risks that we were trying to manage, in particular for compliance, um, we did a survey to all our users. And these were um, the, the casual workers as well as the administrators and asked them what they thought about the current processes and systems and what we could do um, to improve that in the project. And very positively, they came back and these were some of the areas that they wanted us to address uh, in terms of benefits for themselves and, and the value that they were going to get out of being engaged with the project. My apologies, I have, to, I have to stand up because otherwise the microphones won't pick me up and therefore on any future videos or recordings you won't be able to hear me, so my apologies. Um, so risks that we were looking for. Um, flat value payments, what we mean by that is sometimes with all of the best intentions, people will work out how much it's going to cost for the time and the hours and the holiday pay and then they roll it all up into a nice payment and say, for this work we'll pay you £100 or whatever it equals. And um, with legislation and as things moved on, that needed to really be broken down into its component parts. So we weren't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily incorrect in how we were paying, in what we were paying, but how we were doing it wasn't necessarily right. Late pay claims, some of our um, workers, certainly some of our students would sit on their claims and then claim them all at once, a bit like a savings scheme put them all through before the uh, summer holidays and we wanted to make it so that they went through more regularly and more often. Um, data quality issues, we had unpaid voluntary work that we needed to monitor. So for our tier four students, whether you're paid or not, the work that you do still counts towards your hours. So we need to be able to track that too. We had personal data in m multiple places, depending on which departments that you went to, they might take and hold your information and we needed to try and make sure that we knew what we were holding and where we were holding it. And we really wanted to create a central repository that we could share. Um, so that we had right to works being done across campus. And while we had training and guidance and a whole raft of other support for that, it was very difficult for us to get auditing. It was very difficult to get reporting. And it was very difficult for us to just make sure that as things changed and moved on, as they liked to, 
you know, those of you who've been doing rights works for a long time, like I have, at one point it was a photocopy, then it was a photocopy with your name on, then it was, it must say this. We just like to tweak it every so often. And again, getting that message out there to people that before it was this, but now it's that, is really hard. So we were looking at all of these potential issues that we got and trying to make sure that we could address them all through this one project, which was quite um, an ambitious aim that we had, but one that we were reasonably, sorry, reasonably successful in. Um, I also wanted to say, if anyone has any questions, we are more than happy to take them as we go, if something occurs, or if you want to wait to the end, that's absolutely fine. Okay, click. I'll let you click. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, but as Lisa uh, mentions, a lot of the staff weren't aware of these issues uh, and risks. Um, so education around this was um, a big part of the project to make sure that they, they were aware of what we were trying to achieve and the impacts of if any of these risks came to be realised. Another um, key uh, area that we've, we've had a lot of positive feedback from uh, the groups are uh, that we were clear on the future state right from the beginning. What, are, uh, what will it look like in the future? And, and it gives um, clarity and removes uncertainty is the feedback that we've received. Uh, this is um, the vision of how we wanted the, the, the new processes and systems to work for administrators. Um, and we, we talked people through this right from the very beginning. And so um, the assurances were there um, for, for people to be engaged with. Another key element of engaging the users was we were building a system with the external supplier. So every month we had a, a user group session. Um, so a lot of engagement with that. We invited people from, from the departments and we never had less than 30 departments represented. So in every one of those sessions we did a demonstration of the system and how we'd progressed. Uh, and also some areas where we wanted their input, we'd ask for that input in the user groups. And again, they, they felt engaged with the process. If we got decisions um, that we could, um, we had options, we could put that to the users and get their opinions on that before we did make those decisions. And again, it got their involvement in that. So it's a big positive from the users. Um, and we have had very positive feedback. So, and if I could just, I'll get close, if I could just interject. As a project team as well, we had some rules that we tried to live by. And you'll have to forgive me because these aren't formal terms. But when we were trying to design systems and processes for people, there's, there's, I've heard other people give this a name, but to me, we tried to use the Amazon standard. So I don't know about anybody else. Nearly everybody I know can shop on Amazon. There's no help notes for how to shop on Amazon. There's no help desk to ring up to say, what do I do? It, it walks you through it. And we, we had that. We had um, some other things, that aspirational aims. One touch data, data should only be touched once, it should never be passed somewhere else to be rekeyed, to be moved around. Once we'd acquired information in one department, it should be available to another department without anybody else having to do anything with it. And the other thing that we tried to stand by as a project team was, would I do it? So if I worked in a department and somebody gave this to me, would I do it or would I be sitting in the department going, what on earth have you given me now? And if I wouldn't do it, why would I ask anybody else? So while we clearly articulated to our users our future state, we had some standards or minimum standards that we were trying to aim for to make this a really successful project because the easier it is for our departments to use, the more chance there is that they're going to use it. And um, so we were sticking to some of those principles and they were kind of guiding, guiding principles that we went back to time and time again. Mm. Sorry, Dan. That's all right. And, um, and I think that was... Um, the way we challenge the, the system supplier as well that we're developing this. Um, our experience of some systems that we use at universities are they're built by the IT people. They're not users, they're not end users. And they build something that they feel does the job, um, but it might add several steps and not follow any logical flow. So that was quite a big part of the project um, where they were giving us something that they felt meant our requirements, but then we'd send it back and say, this isn't a good experience we need that to be changed. Um, so there was quite a bit of to in and fro in there and quite a bit of challenge back as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what we will deliver, so this was the new capability and again the idea is um, explaining this from the start, what are we going to deliver as a project? Um, as Lisa mentioned with minimum standards uh, but trying to get across to the users what's in it for me? 
Um, so very clear what we're trying to achieve, the central support um, that was coming in and explaining and, and covering that. We wanted to re-engage and, and engage with staff in terms of training them and educating them why we're doing this, rather than just showing them how to use the system. Why does the system do it this way? Um, processes were a lot more simpler and consistent across all departments as well. Um, and the database and GDPR all stored in one place that we could report on across the whole university as well as departments. This slide is looking at the structure. So this is um, structure and approach to the project. And again, this is the first time I've done it in this approach and it is a huge benefit where we looked at creating the capability first and then apply that capability whilst in projects. So in previous projects that I've worked on, it's creating um, the new capability and then handing that over to the business and getting the business to sign off. In terms of the approach we adopted um, in this project, we created that new capability in the four strands that we had there. So uh, people, process, policy, and then the technology side. Um, we built that in, in collaboration with the, the system and the, the capability owner, which was HR, and they were identified from the very beginning. And so they owned that and then drove that development and configuration right from the very beginning. As we created the, the resources that were going to manage this in the team, they then came on board with the project, um, they understood the system, they worked with it, they tested it, and then when we came to apply it, it was the HR function that applied the new capability. And so there was no handover. Handover was in the project, and the, the ultimate system or capability owner had applied that new capability themselves. And they got all that knowledge, understanding, and experience from that. Um, and uh, the case of it, the, the first payroll was run in September, and then we looked to close the project in October. So that's how quickly that turned around as well. So it, um, it expedites and you've not got any issues uh, further down the line about handover and sign off because the business owner has been involved right from the very beginning. How we manage the change? Um, yeah. Uh, departments that were impacted were involved throughout and as we said when we started the project in, in January last year we invited departments to send representatives to our user group. We went out and visited departments. A lot of time and effort in that, um, in that engagement and uh, I think it's a Boris Johnson quote in terms of uh, a love bomb uh, going out there and getting their, um, their fears and concerns and how we could address and work with them on that. Um, HR owned the change and faced the users. So it was a multi-department project. So we've got HR, finance, careers, and IT working on this with an external supplier. Um, but one of the best things that happened was HR owned that from the very beginning and then they faced the users. So um, in the past, as a project manager, I've been the face of the project and people come to me with questions and the project might have been closed for a year, but people still identify as me as that project. In this project, the business owner owned it from the very beginning and they were the face of the project, so they'd be the person that they would go to or, or the department that they would go to. Can I just... Yeah. And, and as, as the person, so I, I, I am that person, I still own this now. One of the things that worked really well with this project with our users was we talked to them a little bit like this. We talked to them about the changes and asked them for their feedback. If we make this change, how will it impact on you? What will it do? What are the barriers? What's going to stop this from working? Please tell us all of those concerns and all of those problems that you're sitting thinking of now in this room and tell us them all. We didn't hide from that. I know quite often a lot of people are nervous about the feedback and, and some negativity. And we turned it this on its head with this project and literally did what we're doing now. Stood up in a room and said, we are thinking of doing this. So tell us all of the barriers and all of your problems, we'll take them away from you and then we'll come back to you with what we believe are the right solutions and you can tell us if we've got it right or not. And some things were de-scoped out of the project because people had fed back to us and they were going to be too problematic and other things came in. And that voice of the customer was a thread that went throughout this whole project talk to us, tell us. We, don't want, we didn't want silent partners. We wanted people who would tell us and actively engaged in all of the negative feedback 
that they had throughout the whole project. Tell us what's wrong with it. Tell us what's wrong with it. Tell us why it won't work. Give me all of that information. And we can take it away, look at it, and change what needs to be changed. So that when we did go live, it was a, <laughs> it was a very quiet day, yeah. the day that we switched all of this on. Because we tried to allay all those fears before we'd arrived at that point. And I think, for me, that was one of the things that was perceived as being really different and quite brave. Because it wasn't always the nicest experience to have lots of 30 people in the room tell us all of the reasons why this was never ever going to work. But in the end, we got there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mentioned the user group um, several times, and it, it, it was a monthly meeting throughout the project, and it continues now. Um, for early life support for what we call now super users, so they, they've got the special T-shirt with the S on, and um, and, and we thought the feedback, um, but also um, the feedback from them was essential for the project success. But then we were able to give them direction, education, and support throughout the project as well, and that that has been a, a key one with positive feedback. And some of those were quite challenging sessions, um, but I think we built up the trust and relationship with them um, that they were very happy with. Um, comms, comms and more comms we had the luxury of dedicated uh, communication professionals on this and every project going forward I'm budgeting for that so we had communication specialists from HR, communication specialists from finance and we get quite a lot of positive feedback from other HIs on our project web pages um, bulletins were going out monthly so people were updated and uh, they, they could see where the project was going and even some of the challenges that we were facing the other thing as well is um, policy changes, and it was policy and process changes throughout the project. Right from day one, we were looking at applying the changes to things like removing non-standard pay rates or removing fixed fees, um, and that was all the way up to the, the, the actual system implementation. So people were, um, we could work with them, they were aware that the changes were coming in, we were working with them on the changes. It wasn't a big bang system policy process right at the end, it was a gradual um, uh, change for, for the users um, and change was more BAU. They were expecting change to come, they were expecting to be informed what was coming up and when the changes happened and they had a medium to actually come back to us if, if there were any issues with those changes. And I think one of the things that we didn't do with this project again that was really different for us was we didn't say we were making the changes because of the system. We were making the changes because these were the changes that we needed to make. The system was just going to help us manage things differently and more efficiently later. We weren't doing all of this because the system couldn't do it or because the system made us do it. We were really open about that. These are the changes we will be making regardless of whether we pick this system or that system. And quite a lot of those changes went live six months before the system actually came in. It wasn't that we were changing it because we put a new system. We were changing it because that's what we needed to do. And the, the other thing I think that helped us with the change management for the departments, because we were putting in a global solution, so this is a one solution, everybody uses the same system, it's a global process, which isn't always the easiest thing to get in across lots of multidiscipline departments who are used to doing it their own way. But the solution, when we were approaching them with the implementation of it, is flexible enough to allow them configuration that suits their department, so for their own um, complexities and their own we're special and you'll never be able to make it work for us. So we gave them some scope to design it themselves because I don't run an academic department, but I can suggest to you how you could do things more effectively. So if you want an administrator to do this part of the task, you can. But if you want someone else to do it, you can. It's your choice. If you want to have multiple departments to help you manage your casuals better, so a department of ambassadors and a department, then you can have that. That's absolutely fine. If that department don't want that, they don't have to have that. So we built enough flexibility in that the departments were able to make it fit what they needed, while still at the same time, they were all still going through a global process. And they are all still going through a global process but there's just enough flexibility for them to be able to make it what they need, and that was really helpful as well. Uh, just to sum up, lessons learned and, and uh, things that I'm looking to apply on future projects. 
um, a clear vision uh, for the project. So what is the new state, what's, what it's going to look like from the very beginning and communicate that well. Uh, clear ownership, again, from the beginning of the new capability. So many projects I've seen, especially in higher education, are you're building something, but you don't know who's going to own it and manage it once the project closes. So I think clear ownership, and they own that, uh, and the external face of the project. Um, engage users from the very beginning, um, and you know, what we thought would be really, really challenging was the, the most engaged users uh, that we could wish for. Uh, so communication, key, um, uh, in, in time consuming, uh, but well worth the effort to engage with those users, giving them support, uh, listening to them and, and acting on that. Where possible, ask, don't tell. So if we had options that we could choose, um, so we were looking at things like implementation or how, how they, the system would work, is put that to, these, uh, to the user group and, and ask them for their feedback and input into that before you make that decision. Um, See what value is coming, so make sure that they, they do understand what value is coming their way, what are the benefits and what's in it for them, um, again, from the very beginning. And uh, just to repeat, commu uh, a dedicated communication work stream, um, so people have got every opportunity to understand what the project's about, what we're trying to achieve and how to engage with us. So on all the web pages, there was Lisa and I's phone number and email address, so people could contact us um, if they've got any concerns. And that's it for our presentation. Any, any questions at all? Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I just wondered how you were defining casual workers. So if somebody did a one-off ad hoc, they would go onto this list. The absolutely. How long would you retain that data? What sort of because, because different people can work across departments, so you might do a one-off job in this department and then do a one-off job in that department and, and each individual department won't necessarily know that you're working. We look at it centrally and so we set a timeline and said if you haven't done any work for in, in X length of time, we would contact you and say if you haven't worked for X length of time, does that mean you no longer wish to be a worker with us and we'll deactivate your account and we would then follow that process through or they'd come back and say no it's not that I don't want to work, it's just that I haven't had any work recently but I'd like to leave my account so there is a way for us to manage that uh, process whereas previously it was really hard because one department would say well they only work for me once you can you can close their account down and, and make them a lever off the payroll and all of those things and then the, you then you'd find out that another department had booked them to work and you would just made them a leave those types of things so it gave us that central view so that we could look at, so we could look at that and set our own standard and say, okay, so if you haven't worked for X length of time, we'll ask you. If you don't reply to us, we'll close you down. But if you come back and say, no, no, it's just that I've been doing whatever and I haven't done any work recently, but I will, we'd leave your account open. That's fine. Thank you very much. Any yep. more? Any more questions? No. Okay. Thank but, you very much. Thank yeah. you very much for your time. <laughs>